So, today's sermon is going to be kind of neat. I think we're going to enjoy this one, at least I hope you do. And if not, soon the more comfortable chairs will be here. You can take a nap during my sermons. So, there you go, right? When, when Rob brought the example and I said, oh man, these church, I'll probably stay, these chairs, I'll probably stay for the whole church, you know? So, Jesus loves the whole world. He loves the whole world. And what I mean by that is Jesus doesn't love the ways of the world, but he loves the world. There's a big difference there. Big difference. There's a lot of things that are the ways of the world that Jesus doesn't approve of. But he loves the world. God, in the beginning, created love. And he showed it to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So our first scripture, going to be probably the obvious one. Let's go to John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the absolute most powerful public display of affection that could ever be done. Jesus came, laid his life down to reunite us with God. As church and ministry and all that has progressed, one of the things that we've forgotten is that we serve Jesus, he doesn't serve us. He's after the lost, and so should we. We should be after the lost. We should be about the family business here. A lot of times, People get in this idea of like Jesus is just this genie up there that just grants you all your wishes. That's not true. Jesus is up there asking you for faith and love and community and communication and covenant and relationship. And he'll give those things right back to you. Now, I'm not saying that he won't answer your prayers. He'll do that. But what I'm saying is, is that Jesus doesn't serve us. We serve him. How we serve him is by loving his children. As I've said many times, we are the example. We are the one that people see as the image of God. Let us be the image of love. Let us be the image of grace. Let us be the image of glory. If you want to truly, truly, truly move God, trust Him. If you want to move God, trust Him. When you trust him, he begins to move on your behalf. And you start going, wow, never expected to see that happen. And God was thinking along the whole time that was going to happen. I already had it planned. So trust him. Jesus trusted him. When you come to church, do you display the same love that Jesus displayed? When you come to church, 
do you have the same vision of God's children that Jesus does? Are your eyeballs tuned in spiritually to be able to look at God's children with grace? If you want to know the hardest part of being a pastor, it's looking right past everybody's trash and looking right into their heart and soul and seeing God. That's the toughest part of being a pastor. Being able to separate what the world and the enemy have put on people and look directly in and see that God is in the center of their being. So when I say Jesus loves the whole world, he truly does love every person on this planet. Even with all of the rejection and denial that happens of him. Because his grace is sufficient. Go with me to John 15, verse 9. It's funny talking about trusting Jesus and how much he loves us through being human, we'll put it that way. I was praying about this, and he kept saying, John 15, John 15, John 15. And I'm going, Lord, I've been preaching out of this a lot lately. And I'm always thinking about the front part of the verse when he talks about, you know, I'm the vine and this and that. And then so he takes me down to verse 9 here. And I'm thinking, how is this going to fit in John 15 to love, Jesus' love for the world? And it says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Now remain in my love. When you remain in his love, you remain in an attitude that God is in charge and that you can just love people and not worry about consequences. I'm not saying everybody's going to receive your love, but you don't have to worry about the end result. There's no consequences that come your way. You just plant the seed. And if God asks you to water it, then you water it. And if not, you walk away, let somebody else water it. We, as a Christian society, start to develop this need to control and call it love. But, in the secular world, they write songs about, if you love somebody, set them free. So why can't we do the same thing? Why can't we love people in the way that Jesus does and set them free? One of the things that we as a Christian society are always going to face is people have memories of things that they have been through that they use as self-defense mechanisms. And they won't let you into their bubble. And some of us think that calling them eight times a day and barking at them about God is how you love somebody. That's how you get blocked on somebody's cell phone. And I'm not saying don't check in with them. Check in with them, but be reasonable. And don't come at them with an agenda. Come at them with the love of Christ. 
I've had people tell me, well, I'm calling this guy. I'm getting him saved today. That's not really your choice. Versus getting them saved, why don't you show them the love of Jesus and they'll walk right into salvation themselves? That's what happened to me. Nobody said, hey, you should go get saved. I didn't want anything to do with that. But yet God put it in my heart, go to church. Half the time, when we're leading somebody in salvation, they don't even know why they're doing it. Why don't we prime the gun a little on this one and give them an education? An education in love. Long before we blast them with scripture and blast them with this is how you're supposed to live and why don't you let God be in charge of that? Why don't you just show them the image of God and what his love actually looks like? I don't think some of the people that confess to be Christian out there have truly received Jesus Christ. Because they walk around and most of them smile like this. If you're full of the Holy Ghost and you're full of Jesus, there's no way you cannot at least smile sometimes. Now, I don't walk around grinning from ear to ear all day long. You know what? It's hard to smile when you have a stressful job. But you know what? I do leave my job every day grateful that God has provided for another day. I get to come here and be with you guys and do this. I'm grateful for that. And I want to share the love that Jesus has put in me. I asked God during my session this morning, said, God, and he said, yes. And I said, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to know today? And he said this, my love is sufficient to overcome anything that has or will happen to you in your life. It's sufficient. His sacrifice was sufficient. So it was uh, kind of neat. I was setting Megan up just a little bit. She didn't know about this. But uh, Psalms 23, verses 6. Right? We played that song, Psalms 23, there. And this says this, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That right there is a perfect verse to describe Jesus. I'll read it again. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all of the days. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus was the key to dwell in the house of the Lord. His love follows you continually. It's in you on a daily basis. And let me tell you something. The love of Christ, it doesn't have an expiration date. It doesn't ever run empty. You are always full of that. And it's your job to take it and give it out. Right now in today's economy, if you were to offer free gas to people, you'd have a line out the door. 
Yet here we offer something ten times more valuable than that, which is the love of Christ, and we have empty seats. Like I said, God didn't love the ways of the world. He loved the world. He loves us, and we are that world. Jesus proved his love for us by volunteering to unite us with God. He volunteered to unite us with God. He said, yes, Lord, I will fulfill your scripture. And he brought us into covenant with God. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, that wraps it up right there.